<laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Nadine Greinig, Gwadzi Hiname Suchietza. That's my Indian name. I'm from the Pueblo of Laguna in New Mexico, and I'd like to welcome you to our um, current session of Indigenous Perspectives. And the topic today is points in American Indian activism. So this is presented by Save Our Schools Arizona Network. It's a nonprofit and um, we're non-bipartisan or non-partisan organization. And so I'm so excited today because we have some real stars, mega stars in the history of American Indian activism. And, and um, they're just, I'm very proud to have them here today and honored that they had the time, uh, took the time to be here with us. So I know we're gonna have a great discussion. Um, I, I, as I was telling them before we started, I could take up the whole hour writing about their, um, or reading their bios because they have all individually accomplished a lot uh, over the years. And, uh, but we don't have time for that. Obviously we wanna get to, to hear from them and ask some questions. So uh, for those of you, or those of you who know people who aren't able to join us today, we will be recording this on YouTube. And so if anybody wants that link, just let me know and uh, we can get that to you. But in the meantime, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I am the Tribal Outreach Coordinator for Save Our Schools Arizona Network. I am the former Director of Indian Education for the Arizona Department of Education. And I am the founder and CEO of the Southwestern Institute for the Education of Native Americans, or Siena for short. So now I'm going, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to read these bios because they're rather lengthy, like I said, but not as long as they could have been. So I'm going to introduce uh, first Dr. James Riding in, who is actually a former professor of mine at ASU. And uh, he's a citizen of the Pawnee Nation and the editor of, no, say, let me know if I say this wrong. Is it Wakazo Sa? Wakazo Sa. Wakazo Sa Review, a journal of Native American studies. He seeks to empower Indian nations, communities, and peoples in their struggles to overcome the harmful consequences of colonialism. His participation in local, regional, and national repatriation consultations, meetings, and initiatives on behalf of the Pawnee Nation has contributed to the implementation of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. In 2006, Dr. Riding In was the feature writer of the National Museum of the American Indian Speaker Series. He is the co-editor of Native Historians Right Back, Decolonizing American Indian History. And he is now working on a book about Pawnee cultural survivor, survival under colonization. Dr. Riding In has served as an expert witness in multiple court cases, including Pro Football Incorporated versus Black Horse et al. And Wallapai Tribe, Norris Nez and Bill Bucky Preston versus U.S. Forest Service at L. In 2017, he served as a consultant in Section 106 consultation at the U.S. Air Force Academy. He is currently the Interim Director and Associate Professor of American Indian Studies in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University. So welcome, Dr. Writing in. Our second panelist is Dr. Laneda Warjack. She's a member of the Shoshone Bannock tribes where she lives on the Fort Hall Indian Reservation in Idaho. In January of 1968, she was the first Native American enrolled at the University of California at Berkeley. She graduated with honors in an independent major of Native American law and politics. Dr. Warjack was instrumental in establishing Native American studies as a component of the ethnic studies program at Berkeley. In 1969, Dr. Warjack and students throughout California united together to take over Alcatraz Island in peaceful protest against the federal government's ill treatment of native people and the federal government's repeatedly breaking of treaties with tribes. Dr. Warjack was on the founding steering committee and executive board of the Native American Rights Fund for nearly a decade. She has been a councilwoman for her tribes and served on multiple boards locally and nationally. Dr. Warjack completed her graduate work at Idaho State University with a master's in public administration and a doctorate of arts degree in political science in 1999. Her most recent book is Native Resistance, an Internet Intergenerational Fight for Survival and Life. So welcome to Dr. Warjack. Our third panelist is having technical difficulties, but I will go ahead and, and read his bio, hopefully 
by the end of it, he'll be able to join us. So Mr. Bill Means is a member of the Oglala Lakota Nation on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Social Sciences from Black Hills State University. Mr. Means has been the Executive Director of the Minnesota Options Industry Council and the co-chair of the Minneapolis Police Community Relations Council since 2003. He has also served as Executive Director of multiple organizations, including the International Indian Treaty Council, of which he is a co-founder. Mr. Means has a depth of experience internationally. He has addressed the joint session of Parliament in Helsinki, Finland, on issues related to Indigenous peoples, presented human rights abuses of Indigenous peoples to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, and helped develop the principle of reburial for Indigenous remains and sacred objects with the World Archaeological Congress and the American Association of Archaeology. Mr. Means has extensive experience in negotiation, human rights advocacy, education, and United States versus I'm sorry, United States American Indian relations with regard to treaties made between the United States and various Indian nations. <laughs> Let me have a sip of tea here. My mouth is dry now. <laughs> okay, so by way of introduction, you may have heard of Geronimo Sacagawea, and I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right. Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, Pocahontas. It may be familiar to you, but what do you know about them? What most Americans know about indigenous people of the United States came from TV and movies, the media, or maybe a fourth grade lesson the week before Thanksgiving. In these contexts, it is rare that a native person is depicted as a hero. They are either the villain or the victim, or sometimes a mechanism to help the white man be the hero. Due to historical trauma, poor health, poverty, and other barriers, the academic achievement of many of our K-12 Native American students is below grade level. Perhaps one antidote to turning this around is teaching them about the power of their ancestors and today's activists, giving them something to be proud of. Today, we are going to explore just a few examples of Indians fighting for what they believe in and resisting complete extermination. So I have chosen for this discussion three points in time related to American Indian activism. The Wounded Knee Massacre in South Dakota in 1890. The occupation of Alcatraz, Alcatraz Island, excuse me, tongue twister and braces <laughs> from 1969 to 1971. And the Wounded Knee Siege in 1973. So I'll go ahead and ask the first question. When Bill gets here, he can, he can join in. So I talked about historical trauma, and that is one of the things that's identified at near the top as to why our, our Native children don't achieve at the levels that they could otherwise without historical trauma and these other things that I mentioned. Clearly, there are many, many of us who can achieve at, clear, at high levels, and we have three speakers um, who represent that. But when you think of historical trauma for Native Americans, what is the first thing that comes to mind? And we'll start with Dr. Warjack, ladies first. Hi. When I think Feel of- Feel free to say something about yourselves too that I may not have covered. Oh no, you, you, you did great. Thank you. When I think of historical trauma, I think of the boarding school generation who were impacted by the physical abuse, the mental abuse, and the sexual abuse of the boarding and Christian, well, the Christian and government boarding schools, and the impact that it had on them, and coupled with poverty on the reservation and alcohol and drugs, it hasn't been a, a very good mix. So, Breaking that cycle of dysfunction has been individually done by many people, many people of that boarding school generation. And my parents uh, both were in the boarding schools and they went through that cruel, harsh treatment. And they knew that they had to break that cycle of dysfunction by treating their children differently 
and trying to prepare them for the future. So unfortunately, they didn't teach me the native language because they wanted their children to be able to go into Western society, to go into their education and be able to be accepted. So they, they made all those plans. We, we learned anyway. I mean, we would try to listen to them, then they'd switch languages on us because they were trilingual. So uh, it's a difficult thing to do, but uh, right now our people are still suffering with those consequences and unfortunately not too many are making it, but the generations are changing and the younger generation is coming through really well. So I think it's just a matter of time. Yeah, that's one of the words that is often applied to indigenous people is resiliency. And uh, unfortunately along the way though, we have lost many languages and we lose native languages. I've heard on a daily basis as frequently as that. When our elders pass away and they don't have there's nobody else who knows the language to pass it down. So um, I'd like to welcome Bill Means. He, he made it with a little help from, from Kate, I think, our IT person. <laughs> so um, Mr. Means, can you hear me? Maybe he's gone again. <laughs> yeah, maybe he doesn't know how to. Uh, okay, he's uh, having audio issues, I, I hear. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and, and uh, Turn to Dr. Writing in on what do you think about when you think of historical trauma? Uh, yeah, um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm here in the homelands of the uh, Autumn peoples. We are, you, you and I, Nadine. And um, um, they also were impacted by expansion. And I've been here in the Southwest many years. Uh, my family moved from Oklahoma to New Mexico Neville Reservation when I was in junior high. So I'm wearing uh, um, some uh, clothing that is reflective of the Southwest uh, uh, influence, uh, a Pueblo style shirt made by a Dene friend of mine and a, uh, uh, a Zuni Bolo, because I lived in Zuni Pueblo for four years. So uh, next time I'll, I'll dress in Pawnee garb, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I like the Pueblo stuff. <laughs> I uh, know <laughs> my wife is from Santa Ana Pueblo, uh, oh. so she's also uh, uh, part of the care speaking peoples. Um, the, uh, um, the the term uh, of a historical trauma, when I think of it, I think back uh, in terms of federal policy. And before our uh, ancestors, our, our parents, our grandparents were sent to boarding school, you know, Indian people had already been dramatically impacted by U.S. expansionism. Our cultures were being broken down uh, through military means, uh, through coercion, and uh, uh, they were uh, struggling to carry on traditional ways. And many of them decided that uh, it's probably best to let the old ways go and try to adopt the new ways. Uh, that's a decision I would uh, not have supported, I think, if I was living during those times, but you know, they were living under hard times. Uh, but the, the policy, of the U.S. Uh, was uh, was supported by the by the epidemics that hit us. You know, ninety percent of our people were killed by epidemics. This is a, a a Holocaust that far surpasses anything that Europe saw or the Second World War. Um, the Europeans uh, introduced about uh, twenty something uh, diseases for which Indians had no immunities, and uh, these were devastating. And then there was the invasion. And the invasion was to take our lands, to take our resources, and to politically subjugate our peoples, whether we uh, resisted U.S. expansion or not. And the way that this was done, uh, or justified, excuse me, was through the use of racial stereotypes, the use of, of the language of white superiority and Indian inferiority. And that is still with us today in, in, in coded forms. So, you know, um, with the political subjugation came reservations, uh, the loss of freedom and uh, uh, the modifications in the ways that uh, Indian resistance occurred. As I mentioned, not all Indians uh, could resist militarily. Um, they lacked the numbers to do so. And if they had tried, it would have been an invitation for them to be wiped out. 
Exactly, thank you. Um, Mr. Means, are you with us? Can you hear us? I'm still having audio and I can't read lips, so he's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's probably the, but I guess he can hear us, but we can't hear him. That's what Kate said. So they're still working yeah. on it. Okay, well, we'll come back to that question for, for him. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, because we do have a short, short period of time to cover a lot of history, actually. So, um, as I mentioned, one of the things that we wanted, I, uh, one of the areas I wanted to cover was the Wounded Knee Massacre. Um, it was known it is known as one of the last major conflicts between the U.S. government and the Plains Indians um, in South Dakota. Can you tell us how incidents like this, in which over 250 Lakota men, women, and children were killed by the 7th Cavalry Regiment, of whom only 25 were killed? I, I understand a few died later. Um, how can that affect Native children today? I mean, why does something that happened so long ago you know, still have an impact. Either one of you, whoever is, can go. I can only mention it in the terms of the prophecies and from the Don't Hopi prophecy, from the Hopi prophecy that marked the time of when the tree of life was cut at the base. And it was a horrible time for a lot of people because it was, it happened everywhere. And in, in different numbers, in different places. And the people that, ha that survived those massacres, it's, it's left an imprint. And I asked my dad, how come nobody really talked about it? And he said, it was too sad to talk about. So the next generations, I know they are having a, a difficult time in dealing with it, the following generations. And they just have to learn to to be strong and to be resilient and to continue on because we always survived. Maybe not all of us, but some of us survived and we're just continuing on into the future. And it had a, a horrible impact, but we're, we're picking it up. So it's been, I've, I've heard a theory um, that you can genetically pass on trauma. So children of people. Children of children of people. Children of people. Did you guys hear that? Did you guys hear that? <laughs> I've heard that. No, that I've been, no I've been, I'm, 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 Hopefully not. I don't sound that way to everybody. But yes, yeah, so I uh, heard the theory that uh, trauma can be passed on through the blood, through genetics, um, to children. I uh, don't know if you subscribe to that theory or not, but. Well, it's a great sadness. Yes, yes. And being able to stand up and to resist, it ha it's, it's very hard to do, but we know we have to continue. And with each generation, it's a little bit lighter uh, because it, it's like losing someone in your family. I mean, that was our family. And the, what, what you go through, the grief that you go through is very traumatic. Well, I know that um, stress can have a detrimental impact on your health. And um, if, you're, if you're trying to recover from cancer, for example, um, if, you're, if your attitude is negative or if you have other stressors, I mean, that can impact with how well you heal or you respond to treatment. So to me, it makes some sense. Um, yeah. There's yeah, there's also research that uh, shows that uh, diabetes stems from stress and the stress of colonialism in particular. 
So those effects are still with us today. Many of our people are suffering from uh, diabetes and it's uh, one of those insidious diseases that, that just take you sometimes one limb at a time. Well, you also mentioned Dr. Warjak, you know, about the boarding schools, and, and my mother was a product of the boarding school as well, and, and so therefore I don't know my language. I know words and phrases, um, but there's no way I could converse in Laguna because of that, and uh, you know, because of what she suffered, she she brought her children up a certain way. Um, some things were not as pleasant as others. Some ways were not, but. Um, so I, again, I can see that being passed down, whether it's through genetics or just behavior, I mean, learned behavior. Um, yeah. I know Mr. Means is still trying to connect. Are you okay? Is that mute button? Is your mute on? No, he's connecting. Like he had it and then it looks like he's connecting again. So Mr. Means, do the same thing that you did the first time because you were connected and just muted and I'll ask you to unmute, okay? or don't touch anything, just talk. <laughs> there you are, there we go. Be now. Okay. He's on, go ahead and unmute. I'm sending that request to you, Mr. Means, so you should be able to see it on your side. I see a telephone with a line through it next yeah. to his name, I don't know what that means. Do you know where your mute button is? That's what Dr. Writing is trying to help you find. So on your screen, look next to your name. Or, and then down below that, there should be a, a mute, like a microphone. And if it has an X through it, you need to click on it. Mine's at the bottom of the screen on the left-hand yeah. side. Microphone. Just just yeah. He's connecting on his phone, so it's a little... Oh, bit okay. It's a little bit more of a challenge there. Okay, well, just yell out when you're, you're connected. So, okay, so we've talked about colonialism. We've talked about inv the invasion of, of Europeans and, and then expanding across the nation and the diseases and all boarding schools and all those, those kinds of ill effects. So, but at some point in time, those physical conflicts with military versus uh, indigenous people came to an end to, for the most part. Um, so the American Indian Wars started in the 1600s and, and were all virtually completed by the end of the 20th century. So Dr. Writing in, as somebody who has devoted your, his career to studying colonialism and the detrimental effects that it has had on indigenous people and continues to have, on indigenous people of the United States. Can you kind of set the scene or describe to our audience how or what led to the transition from all out war to, to Indian activism? All right, yeah, let me begin with a couple of definitions. One is of colonialism, and I mentioned it a while ago, and colonialism is about the taking of land, resources, and labor from other peoples, you know, for the benefit of the uh, uh, of the uh, country that uh, is the aggressor. And then uh, it emerges into what we call settler colonialism. And settler colonialism is about the erasure of Indian peoples. So we've been through that uh, in that history in this country. But with that said, uh, you know, not all Indians responded in the same way. As I mentioned earlier, uh, not all Indian nations had the capacity to uh, launch or to uh, uh, engage in uh, armed resistance. But um, even if they didn't, they engaged in diplomacy. Um, then there were such things as voluntary removals. Some Indians could, uh, Indian nations, peoples could see what was coming. And rather than fight or try to live with those peoples as neighbors, they chose to move. And uh, I think the best example of that is the Kickapoos, who uh, uh, some of whom ended up in uh, Mexico uh, as a way to get away from uh, US domination. Um, and some uh, uh, cooperated uh, with uh, the U.S. military as allies. Um, but um, irrespective of whether Indians resisted militarily or not, they were all subjected to a course of assimilation as the, uh, as the, uh, uh, 19, uh, the 1800s progressed. And uh, with the boarding schools, 
we saw the imposition of a Dawes Act, which was designed to break up Indian values of uh, communal land ownership. The idea being if Indians could be converted into farmers living on 160 acres of land, they could become assimilated and forget who they were, who they are, and what they will be in the future in the context of Indians. They were supposed to be white Americans. So uh, coercive assimilation had tremendous impacts on, the, on our peoples. Um, during this time period of, of the uh, late uh, 1800s, uh, the uh, uh, Interior Department implemented what's called the Codes of Indian Offenses that were designed to destroy Indian culture. And I mentioned earlier about the, the language of racism, of white superiority and uh, Indian inferiority. Let me just briefly read a passage from uh, the codes, codes of Indian Offenses that, that, <coughs> excuse me, that address this uh, issue. It says, these feasts or dances are not social gatherings for the amusement of these people, but on the contrary are intended and calculated to stimulate the warlike passions of the young warriors of the tribe. So, you know, the use of the stereotypes, you know, never mind that the United States moved across the continent, engaging in whatever Indian nation in warfare that offered resistance, and then they dared to call our people uh, warlike. You know, who's the warlike people? Uh, we were defending our lands, our, our people, our cultures. So uh, this is something that uh, a strategy that uh, white America developed to justify and rationalize, you know, the killing uh, of Indian peoples and the political subjugation, as well as the denial of human rights. So it's a, it's a, a history that is rarely taught in schools and the impacts of those uh, uh, policies are not addressed in schools to my knowledge. And that's what we're doing here today. So I think, thank you for uh, putting this program on. You're welcome. I, I just think it's so important. You're right. Like I said, I worked in, in education at the Department of Education for nearly 18 years. And I visited a lot of Title I schools. I was assigned 40 um, school districts and charter schools that were on or near Indian reservations. And so I, I, I worked with educators who knew very little, if anything, about uh, the history of the students that they were teaching. And that makes for a big barrier and, and, and hard for them to connect those students and actually make a difference to them. So that is important. I hope we have a lot of educators listening in for them to yeah. learn more about, about our history and understand why sometimes it's hard for a Native student to, you know, to do as well academically because they don't all, only have the challenges of historical trauma. They've also got poverty and nutrition issues and health issues and and sometimes, unfortunately, abuse uh, issues at, at home. Or, you know, so there's a lot that is cha challenges them. As Dr. Warjack and you have both said, you know, we, we've come through that. We're coming through that. We keep fighting. We keep um, doing what we can. But it takes people's understanding and knowledge and information. And that's why we're doing Indigenous perspectives in this series, because we're talking a lot of, a lot of different topics that are designed to inform people so that if they do want to make a, a better impact, they're, they're doing it from a, a place of knowledge other than non-native um, resources that they've had up to now. Mm -hmm. Mr. Means, can you hear us? Can we hear you? <laughs> no, not yet. We can see you. It's nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so then, um, after all of this has happened then and you know people have been removed and uh, relocated and unfortunately some tribes were wiped out completely um, what, what brings us to a point where where a group of native people decides to take over an island like alcatraz the, uh, from what i understand alcatraz was um i don't know what the term is and you can tell us um, Dr. Warjack, because you were there, but supposedly it was up for grabs in a way, or at least that's how it, it was seen as land that was not assigned to anything in particular, or, or and so so the um, so the students that and that you were a part of decided, well, this could be a good place to have a community center with lots of different kinds of activities and, and ways for indigenous people near San Francisco to get together. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, if I'm way off, <laughs> but 
Um, the question is, um, like I said, you were there, you were one of the first to arrive and one of the last to leave. Um, now the occupation happened from November 20th, 1969 to June 11th, 1971. So about 18 months, a little over that, close to two years. And it, it has been said that you were the real leader of the occupation, not necessarily the American Indian Movement or people who, who led that, um, that organization at the time. So what was the purpose of the occupation and how did, it, how did it impact American Indian activism going forward? Well, we were students in the local California universities. We came out on relocation and we were able to get into San Francisco State University. They had the third world strike both at SF State and at UC Berkeley. And we were a part of that. And that's how we got Native American studies and ethnic studies. So <clears throat> being a part of that student population and fighting with uh, every, the third world people that we did, uh, I think it's just, uh, we were empowered. We were empowered individually as it was. And taking the island was, uh, to us was a treaty breaking a treaty. It was a uh, federal surplus property. That's the term and, I was looking for, <laughs> surplus property. And uh, they didn't want it anymore. And there was uh, an early uh, Lakota landing party that claimed the island under their treaty. And when the government was turning it over to a billionaire to set up as a casino, then we just thought, well, that's a break. They're breaking another treaty right in front of us. I mean, how dare they in this day and age? Of course, that was, what, 50 years ago? <laughs> but uh, they, they broke every treaty the government did. And when I was on the reservation, uh, my father was fighting the legislation with the Indian Land Claims Act and um, with Public Law 280, he was the chairman of the tribe. So I already had an introduction. I was just raised that way because as children, we saw what, what happened and what happened to him. And so it wasn't anything uh, different. Our people had always been fighting, but they were never acknowledged or recognized. There was never any enforcement of laws that could support us. And the main thing was they were not enforcing treaty rights. So that was enough for us to, as young people, to say, we're, we'll take the island. And they're breaking another treaty and they're not enforcing the laws where it was federal surplus property and it can go back to native people. So we took the island to bring out all the issues. The tribes were fighting in the Pacific Northwest for their fishing rights and their treaties. And that was already going on. And of course, you know, where I came from, my dad was fighting the uh, Termination Act and the Indian Land Claims. So it had a big effect on all of us. And the good thing about it was the first thing that President, and everybody hates him, President Nixon, he was the first and only president that ever did anything for us. And he first, the first thing he did was stop the Termination Act in 1970. And he gave his Indian policy on Native Americans, which is the first time that happened in years. So it did uh, bring about change. And we were, we were still on the island trying to 
uh, do what we could in terms of uh, handling uh, the government's uh, lack of attention. You know, we've been through that so many times they would not uh, give us the attention that we needed. Uh, poverty was prevalent. We had alcohol and drugs. Fighting that cycle of dysfunction on the reservation and the federal, the federal government had their hands in all of it. That's what they created. And we were just trying to break away from all of that and to see if there was such a thing as justice in America, which unfortunately we're still fighting to this very day and trying to get our laws recognized. Yeah, so as Dr. Reitingen said, we're, we're still, the war hasn't necessarily ended. It's just being fought differently. Um, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> Mr. Means, you look like you were with us for a second there. Did we lose you again? Come on back. Can you hear me? I can't hear you, unfortunately. You're talking, but I can't hear you. I wonder if he could call in and. Uh, you want to give me a call and I can put you through on my cell phone and we can put you on a speaker. Kate, do you want to give him my number? Yeah, we'll do. Okay, thanks. I'll try to get through. Um, it was busy last time I tried. Okay, because the next question is his. <laughs> so. Let me ask oh, oh, this. What's while that? Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I'd just like to say something. Okay. About the yeah. Um, that was no, uh, November 1969, and I saw it from a different perspective. Uh, uh, myself and Bill, we went on our senior uh, graduation uh, experiences to Vietnam. He was in the Army, I was in the Navy. And I was coming back from Vietnam in November of 69 under the Golden Gate Bridge. And there was a takeover going on. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'd seen all those war movies about uh, the U.S. ships going under the Golden Gate Bridge, returning victorious from, from fighting the Japanese. And, but uh, it was different. We're coming back and, you know, it was Indian people again fighting the U.S. government. So things changed dramatically from when I went into service in 1968 to 1969. Yeah, there was very... Well, we had the, the resistance going on in terms of fish-ins in the Pacific Northwest, West, the, uh, the rise of the uh, National Indian uh, Youth Council that uh, was educated young Indians that were fighting for Indian rights, sovereignty against, the, against colonialism. So it, it was, all this came together at this time. And uh, like Lenata said, you know, they, uh, we were empowered by the white man's system of education. We could use it for our own advantage and also we learn from our, our own people and that's the best knowledge we can get. It's much more reliable than what's uh, in history books or school books about our people. Thank you yeah. for that. I was just gonna ask, ask if either you or, or Mr. Means was, were there. So. What I wanted to mention is that we did have a lot of uh, Vietnam uh, veterans come to the island and stayed on the island with us because they knew how to fight if it came down to us to it and of course we were happy to have them come and support us as well and at that time we uh, organized the Native American Rights Fund I was on the founding board and executive board of the Native American Rights Fund, and we did take that fishing case in Washington State and were victorious in getting that Bolt decision, which uh, enforced the treaty rights. So we approached it both in terms of, of activism and also, you know, through the system to try to work through the courts. Of course, the courts were never very good in terms of giving us justice, but we were able to get some cases through that uh, were really very helpful to our people. And that's been the last 50 years. So would you, would you, could you say then that uh, the historical trauma that, that your ancestors dealt with and then who taught you about it 
actually motivated you as opposed to hold, bringing you down or holding you back? Well, I already lived through it on the reservation before I went out on relocation. I saw what was happening. Like I said, um, my father was fighting the Termination Act and the Indian land claims where they were justifying the land steal through that legislation. And I already saw what the poverty that we lived in, the fact that we couldn't get employment, the racism, the discrimination, you know, I already lived through that before I even went on relocation at 18. I was raised in that. Yeah. So, so coming to California, it was like, oh, okay, we're, we're young people, we're students. Uh, we're going to start our own colleges, our own curriculum, our own Native American studies. We're going to, we're going to support treaty rights. We'll support it any way we can. We'll take Alcatraz or, you know, we can do a number of things to try to bring those issues out because our people were fighting already out on the reservations. And... Uh, I just happened to be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the power and energy of youth, that's great. All right, um, Mr. Means, can you hear me? Uh, yes, you hear me? Yay, we have, uh, we have sound. <laughs> well, welcome, I'm glad you were able to make it. And thank you, Kate, on the back end, getting getting him connected. Um, so we've, we've discussed uh, I know you have the questions. We discussed the first few already, and now we're we're actually down to um, we talked about a little bit about the Wounded Knee Massacre. We didn't tell too many details of that, but ma mainly how it uh, how it uh, could cause historical trauma events like this, and and be you know imposed. I'm trying to look for a good word on. Um, our youth as, as we go through each generation. And, and of course we talked about the al occupation of Alcatraz, but I wanted to bring it back. The reason I, I wanted to focus on both wounded knee incidences was to connect the two. And because they're, you know, they're about a hundred years apart. Um, now, I don't know, were you at the wounded knee siege, Mr. Means? Ah, uh, yes, I was from day one till the last day. I was part of the last four people that left. Oh, really? Okay. So I know your your brother, Russell Means, who's no longer with us, um, he was an actor and a writer and an activist. And um, he was a leader of the American Indian Movement, one of the leaders. I think he served as president uh, at, um, for, what, nine, year, 10 years, 20 years. From 68 to 88, is that correct? Can you hear me? Yeah, what was that last part there? <laughs> that he served with the American Indian Movement for about 20 years, your brother? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and he was very uh, active. Uh, I have, I looked it up and uh, apparently he orchestrated a takeover of a 1970 replica of the Mayflower ship in Plymouth. Massachusetts a prayer, had a prayer vigil in 1971 atop Mount Rushmore National Memorial and a week-long occupation in 1972 of the Bureau of Indian Affairs headquarters in Washington DC. So this was followed, that particular incident was followed by the Wounded Knee Siege in 1973 and you, you were there. So what can you tell us about that time and how it might, why if it was related to the original, to the massacre in 1890. Why was that place chosen to, to do this? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, Alcatraz itself, I was like, uh, I heard Mr. Writing in saying, or Dr. Writing in, that we came back a similar time, 1969, uh, when Alcatraz was being occupied. I had the honor of uh, meeting the AIM leadership at a meeting in San Francisco that was taking place to 
one of the things that was always uh, kind of a thorn in our side is they were forming another national Indian organization, which, of course, we opposed. We thought we had enough chiefs, not enough Indians. <laughs> so so uh, we opposed it, but we got to visit uh, with the people. We took a boat out to uh, Alcatraz. And that was the inspiration uh, for myself, just coming back from wartime. And uh, I believe that it gave me uh, inspiration. A lot of people during that time were inspired that people would, uh, you know, put their lives on the line for our treaty rights, uh, put their lives on the line for education, all the issues, uh, boarding schools, uh, you know, the health and welfare of our people. So starting there, that's where I got my uh, inspiration. And of course, uh, looking at the background of Wounded D actually started in uh, 1862, when uh, 38 uh, Dakotas were hung in Mankato, Minnesota, in the largest mass hanging in the history of the Western Hemisphere. And uh, we realized as Lakota, which means we're farther west, that we had to make a stand because they were hanging our people publicly. And so our people got together and said, well, uh, and there's uh, some humor associated with that. There's a, a young man by the name of George Armstrong Custer. And he, uh, he was a uh, Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army. He stated to the Congress in Washington that he'd take care of the the Sioux in about six days, he said. And uh, he wanted to go out west and take care of the Sioux problem. So he, what he did was, before he left to go out and take care of the Sioux, he stopped by the BIA, which stands for Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, and uh, he told the people in a big meeting there at the BIA, he says, don't do nothing till I get back. And so that's why the BIA to this day has never done nothing for <laughs> people to wait for Custer to get back. But unfortunately, he met his fate on the Battle of Greasy Grass at Little Bighorn River in Montana. And so that's where we made our stand because we knew in 1862. This was before we signed our big treaty in 1868 that we had to make a stand against the U.S. government. And so because of that, Wounded Knee 1890 took place as a revenge. The same Calvary, 7th Calvary, who we defeated at, uh, in Montana in uh, 1876. Uh, this army then killed 300 men, women, and children, and buried them in a mass grave. And wounded knee that's still there today to remind us of the way the United States has treated Indian people since time immemorial. And so that's the background of the Indian wars in South Dakota. We had many battles with the United States. We won some, we lost some, but we never backed down. And so that's where we patterned the American Indian movement. We started a grassroots movement uh, based in Minneapolis, but it soon moved to the reservation because AIM always had an attitude of, we don't back down. Instead of going away from problems, we go to the problem and try to solve it with our people in mind in the grassroots level not from some created bureaucracy, but by in our reservation communities and urban communities. And so we worked very hard, not only to confront the three greatest institutions that has hindered the progress of Indian people. We found, and you know, we had many meetings. We just didn't start going out demonstrating. We had some meetings where we decided, well, we need to see who, uh, who's our enemy. 
And so we agreed that we had four greatest enemies of the people were the church because of their, what you call ethnocide, which is a phrase coined by a uh, uh, um, French professor at the University of Paris. And uh, this ethnocide was the destruction of our culture through the use of boarding schools, through the use of the church. And that's why we named them as one of the number one uh, enemies of Indian people, because what they did to our way of life and put us in church every day. Matter of fact, my knees are still sore to this day because I went to a Christian boarding school yeah. and I prayed for seven years straight. And uh, I never really saw the Lord or Christ or the creator, but I got sore knees, I know. And yeah, so, I, I know some Catholics with scars on their knees <laughs> from all that kneeling, too. Yeah, so anyway, just to kind of wrap it up, uh, how AIM got started was then we, like, for example, in Porcupine, our little home community on the Pine Ridge Reservation, we started to call uh, meetings and we started using Robert's Rules of Order to kind of guide us. Oh, first, let me see who the other enemies that we decided. First, there was the church. Second, there was education. Because within the church, we had boarding schools in the Catholic church. We had government boarding schools in which the philosophy, philosophy was uh, save the man, kill the Indian. As you know, that's a famous uh, philosophy of Indian education as uh, these educated people will attest to. And so that became one of our focus of our work. And then the other one was the uh, uh, corporations that kept coming to our land and negotiating contracts, some in perpetuity, like in Arizona amongst the Navajo, Peabody Coal, and some of those early companies came to our land. And so those corporations were another target. We're still battling out today in the Black Hills of South Dakota. So we focused on uh, those enemies of Indian people, and we began to build movement around confronting those institutions that controlled our daily lives, whether it was a local boarding school, the IHS hospital, or the churches. We demanded that if the churches want to save our souls, then they should be like the black community. They should be on the reservation fighting for social change, fighting for voting rights, fighting for those things that would empower our people and allow us to work towards social change. So those were the focus of the American Indian Movement. We built institutions, schools. So we didn't just talk about it. We went into a mode of what we call, my, one of my favorite words in all of English, our phrase is self-determination. That's what we were trying to teach our people and ourselves. How do we implement our own social change with our own people? Because we saw for too long the white administrators that continued to pet perpetuate the policies of the United States government. So I'll leave it right there for now. Thank you. Yeah, as I said at the outset, um, an hour is a very short time to cover all of these subjects, but at least it's a, I think, a really good introduction to our audience if they're not aware of any of these things. Um, we have a wealth of information, wealth of knowledge here and experience on our call, um, our Zoom. And my call. book, I wrote a book yes. addressing <laughs> these issues. Is that the one that I mentioned? Or is, because you've written more than one book, haven't you? No, it's, uh... Yeah, the recent one is Native Resistance, an Intergenerational Fight for Survival and Life. That's Dr. Warjack's current book. It came out this year, well, for the 50th anniversary of Alcatraz, 
and you can find it at my website. It's not available anywhere except on Alcatraz and in Berkeley and at drwarjack.com. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna get that book and read it. Um, so unfortunately, we're, we only have a few minutes. and We didn't have any questions, but we had a couple of comments. One of them, I wasn't sure what it meant exactly. Um, it says third world strikes on college campuses. I think that was related to what you were talking about, Dr. Warjack, what you were doing, because you, you were part of that developing the ethnic studies program. So you dealt, you worked with other ethnicities as well. Um, yes. Okay, and then our other comment was on the hanging that Mr. Means mentioned, the Dakota hanging um, was actually ordered by President Lincoln. A lot of people don't know that. Um, he was convinced to, to um, that there was justification to hang those, uh, those people. So not every president is uh, what you'd want them to be <laughs> necessarily. I'll leave it at that since we have a, an election coming up and we also have a presidential debate that's starting in a, few, a couple of minutes. Um, I just maybe I'll skip uh, one of these questions, but uh, go to the last one. So just get each of you maybe give a 30 second response to what can Native people and their supporters do to make a positive difference in the lives of Indigenous people? Maybe just mention one or two things that, that people can do. Let me give you again, then. Um, um, I'd say first, empower yourself with knowledge about the history and culture of your own people. Uh, oh, second, sure. don't blame yourself or your communities for the social problems and the dysfunctionality facing uh, our families and our communities. These were impositions caused by the breakdowns of our cultural ways for dealing with these situations. Third, learn about and implement decolonization strategies to restore the balance and harmony that once existed within our communities. And there's uh, good books out there, like uh, I'm looking forward to reading uh, Dr. Warjack's book, but there's also the, the book uh, for Indigenous Eyes Only and for Indigenous Ears Only, which are about decolonization and decolonization strategies. And then um, fourth would be to teach others. And fifth is become active. Take up the struggle. Don't right. let other people fight for you. And, you read the I, I support everything yeah. Dr. Writing In is saying that is really true. And I just tell young people to be ready to represent yourself. Know your history, know your culture, know what you're talking about. Because every one of us are leaders as young people. Because someone's going to ask you, something about Indians. So know, know what you're talking about when they ask you and empower yourself that way and educate yourself. Know what you're talking about. Thank yeah. you. Well, each Indian knows that you, you to a non-Indian, you're the expert on all things Indian. <laughs> right. And that's all of us. Yeah. Every single one right. of us. Exactly. <laughs> which of course, and we're not all artists either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, Mr. Means, 30 second response. What can people do to help indigenous people? Uh, they can uh, read anything related to the idea that Columbus did not discover America. It was discovered by us. And this is after we didn't come across the Bering Straits. We call that the BS theory. So you have to start at the beginning. Uh, that we always been here. We're thriving communities of educated people. And we have a right to be who we are. And that's it. Okay. Well, thank you all again so very much. I'm glad we were able to get Mr. Means on the call because he obviously has a lot to share, had a lot to share, as all of you did. I, again, I just appreciate it. I'm honored that you were able to give us some of your time today. And I'll let you get to that presidential debate. And hopefully we'll talk again soon in the future. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for inviting us. You're welcome. Bye. Good to see everybody. You too. All right.